Hello! Welcome to my ghost walkthrough, a broken triad. This two mission campaign was, for a good while, my all time favorite piece of fan content ever made for Thief. I don't know if it still is. There have been a lot of excellent missions over the last several years that make it hard for me to pick a single favorite. But Broken Triad is definitely still up there. And having replayed just the first mission in preparation for this let's play, I can say that, yeah, it's as good as I remember, and better than Amanda's Bequest in pretty much every way. So let's begin with the first mission, and let's read the briefing. Arkford. A six days march northeast of the city. Far enough for me to keep a low profile. The events in and underneath Farrington Manor compelled me to leave my usual field of activity for a while. Arkford citizens have high standards when it comes to their prosperity. Nobody asks you how your MST reaches, though, which made me fit right in. Still, I don't plan on overstaying my welcome, and after three months, I've seen about enough of this conceited town. Tonight's job will be my farewell present before I head back to the city. A stone bust called The Sleeper is currently on display in the local museum, the Harrogate. The bust is as ugly a piece of art as it is a coveted item among collectors. Instead of being a useless dust gatherer, it would serve a much better purpose if it earned me some money, so I'm going to make it mine. What makes this task interesting are the elaborate security measures surrounding the sculpture. The bust sits on a pressure plate that triggers the alarm at the slightest change of weight. I assigned a sculptor to create a replica of identical weight, which I'm going to exchange for the original. For the time being, that's the only detail I know about Harrogate's security system. Lucky for me, a renowned security inspector happens to be in town, and he has written a detailed report about the Harrogate safety precautions. This report might prove useful in my endeavor. I also managed to befriend one of the museum's curators, Sheila Jennings, and persuaded her to borrow a few keys for me by tonight. It's time for me to pay the museum a late visit. The quicker I finish this job, the sooner I can get away from Arkford. This town has started to give me headaches. Right, Broken Troid Part 1, Arkford. Optional, the security inspector is currently staying in the Basenberg Inn. Locate and steal his report. It should provide you with valuable information about the Harrogate Museum's alarm systems. Sheila Jennings, one of the Harrogate's curators, has promised to get you a couple of keys to access the museum. Go visit her. Find your way into the museum and swap the sculpture, the sleeper, with your replica. Make sure to turn all the security measures around the sculpture back on once you've done the swap. This way, nobody will notice the difference for a while. After you've completed everything, go back to your apartment. Optional, try to avoid triggering any of the museum's alarm systems. We don't need to buy anything, so let's make a real save here. And I'll take a look at the map in a bit, for now let's check out what we have in our apartment. First of all, don't forget to take the fake sculpture with you. Here we have a ticket, placed in all the museum's exhibitions. And a newspaper. The Arkford Observer. Controversial exhibit to remain in Harrogate Museum. Director, the sleeper will not be removed. After the mysterious fainting of a museum visitor three days ago, residents now demand the removal of the sculpture of the sleeper from Harrogate's temporary exhibition. However, John Wilkerson, director and owner of the Harrogate Public Museum, does not intend to give in to this request. The lady didn't faint while watching the sculpture, but only after she had climbed the stairs to the upper floor. She would put the blame on her corset instead of jumping to irrational conclusions. The sleeper stays where it is until temporary exhibition is changed. The sleeper, which is part of the museum's current exhibition, Life and Death, is a sinister stone figurine of an unknown artist who allegedly felt so appalled by his own creation that he dropped dead when he had finished it. Rumors are afloat that by simply seeing the sculpture, feeble individuals might lose their sanity. Mad Beheader is still on the list. City Watch remains clueless. For two weeks now, Arkford has been afflicted by a series of gruesome murders. Since the first discovery of a street beggar's headless body, there have been three more reported victims. It is feared that there are more to come. In a brief interview with the Arkford Observer, Sergeant Billings of the City Watch stated, The murderer seems to pick his victims at random. Each of them gets their head cut off with a sharp weapon, like an axe or a sword, and the killer only leaves the rest of the body for us to find. 
Anonymous sources also claim that the Mad Beheader, as the murderer has recently been nicknamed, carves strange symbols into his victims' chests. Citizens are directed to stay inside during the night and keep their houses locked at all time. The City Watch has been instructed to stop and question anyone suspicious walking in streets after nightfall. In the bedroom we have a journal, but all the pages are empty. No, really, all of them. And in the dresser, got a couple of arrows, which I'm gonna take. There actually is plenty of uses for mass arrows in the museum. What the? What was that? Indeed. Now we can take a look at the map. So, the section of the city we have access to is surprisingly small, but as you can probably see from the video's length, the mission makes excellent use of all the available space. Now we start here, and the Harrogate Museum is pretty much right next to us, but of course getting inside isn't that easy. And first we have to visit Sheila's apartment, right here. On the way there, I'm gonna hit the museum director's house. Now, this section of town we won't have to return to ever again, so there is no reason not to visit the museum director now, and it is in your best interest to do it before actually heading into the museum. And once I'm done at Sheila's, I'll explain the rest of my route. The civilians in this mission are neutral to us, unless of course they see us use what our weapons. <laughs> Can't the guy nap around here? Let's head in here. Oh well. As our first outpost in this town, these premises will certainly be sufficient. It is no white cathedral, but there is enough space for a small seminary. The majority of Arkford citizens seems to be dissatisf dissatisfied with the hemorrhoids, which can only be to our benefit. The sooner this town starts hearing from us, the better. Father Karras will be pleased. And seemingly, there is nothing else here. However... Up here, we can access our first secret. A switch that lowers the statue and reveals a purse. Also, rope up here, <laughs> and by following the sledge, access another hidden area. Something moved there. Well, seems clear. This one doesn't count as a secret, Hello? but we have a purse inside. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> things now. In this watchtower you can find some equipment, there is no loot, and this is the museum director's house. Before we head in there, I wanna grab a purse right here, total 60.
And I wanna rope up here. <gasps> and get a readable. <sighs> the guy in the orange working suit who calls himself Front Turbine brought in the last parts of the wood chipper. The thing seems to be working alright, though I don't understand how it can tell apart what you throw into it. I overheard Turbine mumbling to himself about the builder when he was working. I asked him if he'd been a hammerite once, and he answered that we were at the dawn of a new age, whatever that means. So we can't get into the rest of this building from here, but there is the wood chipper. Gonna keep that in mind, in case we need one later. Museum director's house. First of all, let's pick this wall safe. And here we have a bottle of wine. Total 85, the glasses aren't valuable. And we also have a flower card here. To Elaine, my dear wife, whose patience is beyond words. Come next year. You shall be no more married to a museum director, but to a full-time husband. This I promise. Love, John. Okay. And in the study, you can clearly see there is something behind this dresser. To move it out of the way, you have to throw this cobra head. have a Victrola inside. So that's odd, but it'll make sense once we get into the museum. <laughs> And before heading into Sheila's apartment, we can access our second secret. Saint Bernard protecting our city of Arkford with his blessed hand. Well, we can actually throb his blessed hand. And it opens a hatch right here. Here is a gem, total 110. And now we can head in here. I have a bad feeling about this. It looks like Sheila's home. So a few words here. The reason Broken Triad was my all-time favorite mission for like three or four years is partly because it was one of the very first fan missions I've ever played, and obviously coming fresh from Thief 2, it was mind-blowing to see how much content and detail was crammed into just two missions. So when I say I have a bit of nostalgia for it, that's what I mean. And this right here was the very first time, and one of the very few times, 
a fan mission actually managed to creep me out, which here has largely to do with the sound cue that plays here, which is so unpleasant, it's like, it's trying really hard to get under your skin. Don't know if it's just for me, but this moment was really memorable. Here we have Sheila's letter. Garrett, I know I promised to have the museum keys today, but most of them are simply out of my reach. At least I managed to nick the back door key. You only need to find a way into the cemetery, and you'll be inside the museum. As for the remaining keys, I found another solution. It appears that Yarwick, the locksmith responsible for most of the unpickable doors, unpickable locks, in Harrogate, secretly keeps a skeleton key in his shop. It'll allow you to open any of Yarwick's doors, easily recognizable by their green copper handles. While studying some of the old city plans, I discovered that there are catacombs and forgotten tunnels underneath Arkford's streets, which connect many buildings. These tunnels were meant for soldiers to move unseen in case of invasions, but they've never been used. To our luck, one of those tunnels connects the City Watch station with the Yarwick's shop. I found a gullible enough guard, Ned, who let me into the station unseen. I told him some wild story about treasures hidden underground and rivals who want to beat me to the punch by spying on me. If you give me another day, I'll go and get the skeleton key for you, Sheila. Well, that wouldn't work out, so we're gonna have to get it ourselves. And here we also have Ned's crumpled letter. Dear Miss Jennings, I'll be in the watchtower tonight and keep an eye on your museum office's window. When you give me the signal, I'll unlock the back door and send the other watchmen on my shift outside for a break, so you can come in unseen. Most likely it'll take me a while to get rid of them all, especially Jorik can be a stubborn oaf when he's at the equipment store, so please give me a moment or two. The entrance to the war tunnel is in the last cell. Look for a small switch above eye level at the back of the stone arch next to the cell. Ned. P.S. I burned your note during my outside patrol, like you told me to. So to get into the war tunnels, we're gonna have to first find our way into the museum itself, and into Sheila's office. Okay. And this right here is a clue, but it didn't register with me at all on my first playthrough, and I'll get back to this a little later. Finally... Here is what we came for. Museum back door key. This checks off. Visiting Sheila. And my next goal would be to get into the inn where the security inspector resides. And on the way there, I'm gonna hit a couple of miscellaneous buildings. <coughs> now here is an archer, and it seems like you can't get past him at first, but you actually can, you just need to wait for him to turn away. Which he does sometimes. There we go. Hello. And now we need to wait for him to turn the other way, like hmm. this. Maybe next time. Looks like it's nothing. Ah! Oh, is, is someone over there? That was Looks close. Like nothing. Received new batch of healing potions from the city. Compiled and delivered leaf package for Mr. Martin. Have to look up the more exotic ingredients later on. Received antistatic hair lotion for Mrs. Wigglesworth. Completed and delivered salve for Mr. Porter. His back is acting up again. <laughs> Mm. 
in this money box are some coins. <clears throat> Right there. I saw something. All right, two more coins right here. Total 150. And here is one of the three possible locations of the lamp oil flask. So its location is randomized on each playthrough. Show yourself. Over there we have a sewer hatch which is locked and unpickable. And if we take a look at the map, we see that it's marked right here. All the sewer entrances are. There is one more here, but we can't get to it at all because of the gates here and here. And there is also one right here. So if we want to make our way into the sewers, we're gonna have to check out this place. <coughs> Here we can flip a switch and get into this building. Here are just some rod heads, but if we continue upwards, we can find the ring, total 180, and a couple more mass arrows. There is a goblet. And a sleeping woman here has a purse. Total 215. And this is the second possible location of the lamp oil flask. So if it's not here, by process of elimination, I know where it is. And you'll notice the front door of the museum isn't just locked or unpickable, it's not usable at all. So here is the inn, but before heading in through the front door, we should actually check out the back door. So here is the third and final possible location of the lamp oil flask. It's one of the quest items we're gonna need later. And here is the dark wood tree root, which is also a quest item we're gonna need later. No reason not to grab it right now. <laughs> well, I readjusted the valve so that one full turn of the handle should be enough to make all the guests break into a sweat. Feel free to use it if you need them to get down to the bar for a drink or two. As for those roots breaking through the basement ceiling, you probably won't get the permission to cut down the tree. Dark woods are quite rare, and you don't want to have another argument with that crack-brained conversationist legislator Barker. Having to change the inn's name from Boilenburg to Bathenburg because of his concern about those fine animals 
was bad enough. Jake. So the barman has the in cellar key. And here's a pile of coins. Total 265. And we can read the ledger. Guestbook. Lady Milton, Sir Albert Ward, Inspector Edmund Swan and Bodyguard. So that bodyguard stands right in front of the room and prevents us from getting inside. And to get rid of him, we can do what this note says. Hidden well. Please operate with caution. So now, the bodyguard won't be able to stand there for much longer. Let's save it before heading inside. Nobody alerts to us in the bar area. In this room there is ring, total 290, and the window, which can be another possible way into the inn, or a way out. Hmm. It sure gets hot in here. I think I need a drink. Yeah, just one. So if you've used the valve, in the inn's basement. As soon as you come up here, this guard will start making his way downstairs. Huh? But we still have the security inspector himself to worry about. He just walks back and forth <coughs> in his room. It can be quite difficult to dodge. Here brings the total to 320. <coughs> Better check my map. Here we go. Security report Subject Harrogate Public Museum, Arkford. Inspector Edmund Swan. Recommended for Burglar Proof Award. The building. Harrogate used to be a hammerite church until it was closed down and shortly after bought up by William and Lisa Harrogate. The building underwent heavy remodeling, although some rooms and hallways couldn't be changed due to constructional issues. There used to be access tunnels to Arkford's old catacombs, but these had been walled off long before the church was renovated. What remains is the old cemetery in the backyard, which is not accessible by the public. Plans to relocate the graves are currently on hold, for reasons not relevant for this report. Guard personnel. Security guards patrol the museum around the clock, their numbers being significantly increased during closing hours. The building's narrow corridors provide nearly no hiding space for potential thieves, and the patrol routes represent a very tight security network. Alarm buttons are placed at strategic locations, and their activation not only alerts the entire guard personnel, but signals the nearby city watch station as well. Security systems. The Harrogate is equipped with an impressive amount of security measures, most prominently the energy field in the central hall, which is currently protecting the sleeper sculpture during night time. Its energy source, a collector on the roof of the museum, is completely independent of Arkford's power supply, as it draws energy from the sun and moonlight. Even if an intruder managed to manually shut down the spectral receptor, which requires deactivating both the machinery on the roof and in the basement, an additional security measure would sound the alarm immediately. Four blue rays are orthogonally arranged around the security field, but cannot penetrate it as long as it is operational. If the energy field disappears with the Blu-ray still active, the alarm is triggered. The museum's director, John Wilkerson, is the only person who is authorized to deactivate these security rays. Maintenance Because of the very advanced technology present in Harrogate's security system, its inspector, inventor, George Bolston, came up with a unique way to maintain his installations without the need of specially trained staff. Small, insect-like machines navigate through the museum's air ducts and perform regular checkups. 
such a machine receives instructions through a card that has holes punched in it, and is able to find the destination automatically, as long as its path is unobstructed. This system also minimizes the time the security components are deactivated during maintenance. I remember how overwhelming it was to read for the first time. I thought to myself, good lord, there is so much stuff I'm gonna have to contend with inside the museum. But it's actually not too bad in there. So now this is checked off, and Garrett also said that he should take a look at the map. Which, indeed, as soon as you get the report, you get maps of the museum. And as you can see, the museum isn't very big. And I'll go over these maps when we get there. Next, I want to hit the casino, which is this building right here, and one of the most difficult places in the mission to ghost. they didn't take any damage there when I fell. Who's there? D did you say something? Oh, who's that? Please don't play games. Nothing there. Right. This place must be getting to me. So here we are pretty well lit, but as long as we creep crouch strafe. Hmm, thought I saw something. We can get close to this woman and get her purse without being spotted. <coughs> Can also get in here. Now this is a safe spot because the clerk only faces that way and outwards. And we need her to face outwards to pick the safe. Now it's pretty random when it comes to how long she faces either way. So if you're trying to ghost this without saving and loading, well, good luck. Is someone there? Thought I saw something. Hmm, I'm starting to see Hello? things. Hmm? I'd better get some rest. Oh well. Hello? I see one rat. rat. Hello? I should just scream. Right, we can sneak this way over here and lockpick <laughs> that is slot machines there we go now sneaking in front of sl the slot machines is pretty much impossible because of how well it's lit what you can do however is go <laughs> over them <laughs> speak hello Anyone there? If you're fast no, enough, there's no one here now. Nobody will spot you. There is a coin behind this table. And here we need to slow down a little. There? There are two more coins on this table. Total 635. That's all the loot in the casino. <laughs> One last thing we need okay. here is a key. One rat. I will just Guess it was scream. nothing. Is someone I there? Was nothing. On this guy. So that we can leave. <coughs> Good. I had not wanted to be disturbed. Huh? Hello? Anyone there? It's surprising sometimes what this game lets you get away with. Right, getting out Hello? is also pretty tricky. Hmm. 
because we're gonna be lit as soon as we go outside and the cleric has a good chance of spotting us. What you can do is body block one of the doors, like this, and you're gonna have a bit more cover. Wow. There we go. Right, here we have a burned note. Ned, I've placed an oil lamp at the window of my office. You can easily see it from your tower guard post. Remember, my office is on the top floor of the Hergate Museum. Here is the signal you have to look out for. When the oil lamp is burning and all other lights in my office are turned off, you need to unlock the back entrance of the city watch as soon as possible. Then make sure your pals are taking a break for a while so I can enter unseen. It won't take me long to get to the war tunnel. A few minutes should be enough. Please burn this note as soon as you've... something. Yours, Sheila. So, this is important information. It tells us what kind of signal we need to give Ned. And this is a note I haven't found on my first playthrough. But it wasn't because I didn't know where to look for it, but rather because I didn't think it actually exists. Going back to Ned's crumpled letter, he says that he burned the note, which to me didn't mean that I should be on the lookout for a place where he could have done it, like a fire barrel. Instead, I just dismissed this entirely, because if the note is burned, means it doesn't exist anymore. So then when I got to Sheila's office and couldn't figure out what to do, I needed a bit of help. But this was the only thing in the mission, when it comes to puzzles, that gave me trouble. So, I don't know, maybe it's just my experience and the fact that I had a lot more trouble in Amnus Bequest, but I do think the puzzle design in Broken Triad is objectively better. The puzzles are much more logical and never as convoluted. And I could say the same about Treatables too. They are much shorter, there are some lore documents later on which are a bit longer, but there is not a single 10-15 page journal in this mission. At least not in this mission. Uh, like I said, I haven't played the second one yet. So the readables are also a huge, huge step up in Broken Triad. Over here is a blacksmith key, which we're gonna use to access this building in a bit. At the end of this ledge is a coin. Total 640. Oh well. Don't know what it was. I'm gonna have to wait for this guard. The front door here is barricaded, that's why we need the key. Anybody home? Work journal. Mr. Garrett, the hooded guy who had wanted a replica of that ugly sculpture, came and picked it up today. 
It's not often that clients pay in advance, and it's even rarer that they provide me with the raw material. Thanks to the detailed schematics Mr. Garrett had provided me with, I was able to create a fairly accurate reproduction. It was interesting working with the block he had given me, though I'm still not sure what kind of stone it was. I asked Mr. Garrett today, but instead of giving me a straight answer, he just grinned and pointed upwards. And the blacksmith has been killed by the mad beheader as well. There is nothing to pick up in here, actually. So now we can access this building. Hmm, odd noises. Someone should look into that. This is Mrs. Wigglesworth. We're gonna read a letter from her in a minute. <coughs> and there is a ring here. Total 665. <sighs> and this is the inventor's tower. We don't need to go in here just yet, but I wanna get that readable from Mrs. Wigglesworth. Mr. Bolston, I tried to talk to you in person, but you wouldn't answer the door. With this letter, I'd like to make you once again aware of the disturbances your inventions are causing in the neighborhood. Since you decided to let your machines run in day and night without asking anybody for permission, I might add, the air in my house is charged with electricity. Lights go on and off all by themselves. Each time I try taking a bath, I receive periodical shocks, and worst of all, my hair defies gravity and any brushing attempts. Whatever you are doing up there, I ask that you shut down your machinery immediately. I've already informed the City Watch, and they promised me to look into it if you don't follow my request within the next 24 hours. Lisa Wigglesworth. So this is the house of Mr. Bolston, the inventor of all the security in the museum. We can't access this house fully yet, and we don't need to go in there for now. And this will just take us back to where we started the mission, so we have explored everything in this part. We still have this small section, which we can access. We can't get to the White Cathedral yet, but this plaza we can explore. Delahaye Crematorium. Thy remains are important to us. Now, that last entrance to the sewers I mentioned earlier, you can see it's over there, but there is a portcullis. We can open that. I don't like the looks of that. Imagining things now. Not again. Something there. Like I was saying, we can open that part colors. Like it's nothing. By going in there. <coughs> because this guard is going there, I'm gonna do on my way back. Here is Yarwick's shop. So we're gonna get in here through the war tunnels. Here is a door with a green handle. And there is another one to Hilarious Jewels, so we can't get into these buildings for now. The only one we can access is right here. There is a civilian inside. It can be quite tricky to dodge. Is someone there? So while he is in that room, we can grab a goblet and lockpick the safe. So 
total 710. And in this room, we can get the bellows, which we don't need to finish the mission, but we do need it if we want all the loot. So that guy should be on his way over there. Here is the control room for the portcullis. This door we can pick as well. The room inside is empty. It's just a shortcut. And from here we can also access this building right here. That window is openable, but there is no point in going in there just yet. Manhole cover key. So with this, maybe we can open the hatch right here. Save it here. This door we have to pick. Western surrogate, authorized personnel only. So that opens a grate right here. First, I want to climb this ladder. <laughs> Hewitt and Sons Transports. So that's our house we've been to previously. We were up there, and here is that wood chipper we read about. We don't need to go in here just yet, but we will. So I want to open this gate for later. mechanism of the lower sewer gate is defective. While the switch still operates to the gates, they are never both open and closed at the same time. My guess is that at one time a heavy object prevented one of the gates from closing properly. As a result, one grating now opens when it's supposed to close, and vice versa. We need to repair that thing soon, 
otherwise we can't access the emergency flooding on the other side. So here is the switch that operates the two gates, and to fix them we need to do the exact same thing that broke them. Place a heavy object here, and both of them are now open. Emergency flooding. Do not activate without proper permission. Abuse will be punished. So this is pretty cool. I'm not sure how this was done exactly. The dark engine doesn't support changing water levels during gameplay. So it's pretty impressive. And here we have a crypt is not haunted, so there is no one down here. And this light is a secret switch that allows us to access a pretty sizable area. This is the tomb of the Nameless Riddler. As in life, so in death does he challenge those of a keen mind. Be wary if you enter, for mistakes will cost you greatly. And down here we have a pretty cool puzzle. The true path is revealed only to those who see each number along with the color of its direction. Let me show you what this means. <laughs> so here there is number 2 and a star which, if we look at it like a compass, we see that its east sector is highlighted so number 2 must correspond to that sector, and note also the dot underneath the star. So that star we can find right here, and if the dot is supposed to be at the bottom, we can see that the east sector has a green cloud, so number 2 must correspond to the color green. Similarly, here is number 3, and it corresponds to the southwest sector. That would be the red color. So I'm not gonna go over all of them, you get the idea, I'll just give you the solution. So number two is green, number three is red, number one is orange, four is blue, five is yellow, and six is purple. And then they repeat. Once we make it to the other side, we can throw this, and now only the actual path is highlighted. <laughs> and up here we have to input 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 by corresponding the numbers with the symbols. So orange was number 1, which means that 1 is this symbol right here. The rest of them you can actually see from up here, so green is number two, that's this, and red, blue, yellow, and purple. There was a fat mage who was exceedingly lazy. Buttons and switches were driving him crazy. No more willing to walk up to each, he created a staff of far reach. 
Sadly, they didn't help him out of despair when he became grafted to a squishy chair. <laughs> so in here, we can get a pretty cool item. The Staff of Far Reach. And with it, we can pretty much throb objects, like buttons and switches from a distance. It can be tricky to aim, I'll give you a tip for that a little later. And note also that these energy balls actually make noise on impact, so you can't use it when someone is nearby. So that's it. Pretty cool puzzle. It takes a while to solve, and I actually had to whip out a piece of paper and a pen the first time I did it. But it is satisfying. And the item we get as a reward is really nice too, so you don't have to get it. But if you do, it's certainly helpful. Here is something we can't interact with yet. Looks like we need to put some kind of a hammer in here, so we'll just keep this in mind. <laughs> and here we can climb to some kind of a mausoleum. And this door is locked and unpickable, but if we look around, we'll see that we can interact with this. Cemetery. We can open this and get back to where we were previously. Here lies the body of Brother Reginald. He froze to death whilst watching over Lord Raglan's crypt. May afterlife spend him warmth. And down here is the back door to the museum. Finally. Alright, let's head inside. I hate creepy noises. So we enter the museum through the basement right here, and you'll notice the basement is split into two halves, so to get access to this part we're gonna have to come up to the first floor and cross the lobby. Now our main goal in the museum right now is to make it up to the third floor and into Sheila's office right here and signal Ned. We can access most of the museum right away, not all of it because there are a few of those green handle doors, but I will hit the director's office and the library on my way up. Where I'm not gonna go, however, is the central hall, actually, because there is no point in doing that just yet, and I'll save it for my second visit to the museum. I gotta stay on my toes anyway. <clears throat> Who's there? Hello? Anyone there? Alright, let me show you. The controller room. Hmm. There must be instructions on this thing somewhere. Insert the appropriate punch card into the slot to activate the maintenance unit. When the green ball lights up, the maintenance unit can be launched by pressing the start button. So we don't have a punch card yet, but once we do, we're gonna be able to come back here and interact with this maintenance bot. The 
there is nothing in that office. Over there is the cash desk. In the cash desk there is a safe we can pick, but I'm not gonna do that just yet, because it's actually pretty tricky to do, with the woman patrolling the lobby and the clerk going back and forth between the cash desk and this office. So I'll save that for much later. Hmm. What's that? Cloakroom. Responsibility cannot be accepted for any articles Looks left like in this room. Here we have two coins, total 720. The double door leads to the central hall, of course, which I'm skipping for now. And here I'm gonna use a mass arrow. It's not at all necessary, but it'll make sneaking around a little bit easier. What? <coughs> Navigational globe. The globe displayed here depicts land masses as they were known 20 years ago. While intricate in its design, it is now an obsolete antiquity. Hey, someone back there? Sextant. Oh. This device is used by it's seafarers like as a navigation again. tool. It measures the elevation of celestial objects above the horizon. And we are safe in this corner right here. Anchor. Bloody Beth, the infamous piratess, wielded this particular anchor as a close combat weapon with often devastating results. Let's wait for that guard to pass. The White Squid. This is a scale model of the White Squid, one of the most successful merchant ships ever sailing across the Great Western Sea. The vessel disappeared along with Captain Denko and his crew ten years ago. It is said that it fell prey to the eternal storm surrounding Tempest Island. And we have a picture of that right here. Tempest Isle. Its exact location still unknown, this island has struck fear into seafarers for decades. Legends tell that anyone who encounters it will be unable to escape its initial storm and shipwreck at its craggy cliffs. Crayman. Crayman are dangerous beasts whose natural habitat and breeding grounds are damp underground caves. Their mighty shears can kill an adult human with a single blow. The Crayman's language mainly consists of clicking sounds uttered in rapid succession. Push the button for an acoustic example. Here is a green handle door we can't open. Albina rat, the ugly version of a white mouse. This we can pick, but there is no need to do it just yet. Ape Man and Giant Spider. While the Ape Man has been renounced as a myth, the now extinct Giant Spider used to be a very real danger for animals and humans alike. Although reports of encounters keep appearing to this day, there has been no evidence of the continuing existence of these eight legged monstrosities. Right. And the main reason I came down here is this. Service point 0928. That's the number we're gonna have to remember to get the punch card. Uh, hello? Anyone there? Too tense. things right let's head up to the second floor now there should be a guard somewhere around here I 
think he's right about us. Pedro, do you have any idea where the hemorrhoids have gone? I know White Cathedral is currently closed for renovations, but the entire place looks completely deserted. The Erector Wilkerson wants me to find a priest who can put Brother Reginald to rest. Also, have you noticed Sheila acting a bit weird lately? I first thought it's simply stress-related, but by the way she looks around all the time and how she's startled by anyone entering her office, I get the feeling she's afraid of something. Maybe we should talk to her, Henry. There is nothing in here. Over there is a door with a green handle that just leads to the central hall. Here is the library. Merchant correspondence. This is a partial transcription of a correspondence between two sailing merchants written about 60 years ago. Jeffrey. As promised, I shall recount the amazing discovery I made last September. Even though I can describe the island and its inhabitants in great detail, I am unable to tell you how we got there. All I know is that it happened a few days after we had started our journey back from the west. The crew grew increasingly restless, and it wasn't before long that we discovered the white squid had gotten far off course. Needles no longer pointed north, and even the star's position seemed to have changed. Although I tried telling them otherwise, the crewmen became convinced there was a curse on our freight. There was talk about throwing everything we had acquired overboard, but before the situation could escalate, a cry came from the crow's nest. Land was in sight. We rode to shore, help, uh, hoping to find some indication where in the Great Western Sea we were. With its steep cliffs and craggy mountains, the island was likely an eroded remnant of a long-dead volcano. We left our boats at a picturesque beach, where a dirt track wound its way through exotic vegetation. The path led us to a glade where we discovered structures that couldn't be mistaken for anything else than human-made huts. Imagine our amazement when we realized that this uncharted piece of land was inhabited by what appeared to be at first sight a primitive race of people. They walked around bare-chested, wearing variously dried, uh, dyed loincloth, and their skin was almost as dark as that of the men sailing the southern seas. Lucky for us, they were very welcoming and friendly. Although nobody of my crew could speak their language, the natives grasped fairly quickly that we were merchants from a faraway land. Alas, being no seafaring folk, they couldn't aid us in locating their island on any of our maps. However, they made us understand somebody else could be of help, and motioned us to follow them into their city. And what an astonishing sight that city was! They could hardly believe that these people had managed to build such impressive and richly decorated monuments out of stone. As we walked past these massive buildings, I noticed that some of the wall ornaments looked oddly familiar to me, but at the time, I dismissed the notion as a trick of the mind. I made a drawing of one particular structure we passed that looked like a holy icon or altar. I enclosed it within this letter. Note, a facsimile of the mentioned drawing can be found at the end of the transcription. All the architectural marvels were forgotten when we got to see the amount of riches just lying around. Even common drinking cups were made of gold, not few of them adorned with large gemstones. The last pages of this transcript are missing, and we're gonna read them quite a bit later. Here we have two notes. To the guard personnel. The audio lock next to my office is a mechanism to open the door, and not a musical instrument for anybody to play on. I prefer memorizing a melody rather than a number combination, and that is why it was installed. Please refrain from any attempts at arranging compositions in front of my office. Thank you, Director Wilkerson. To everyone. It has once again come to my ears that several misguided individuals believe there is a hidden emerald room in this building. I'd like to make it clear once and for all that no such thing exists. We renovated the whole place for heaven's sake, and if there were a room like this, we'd have found it years ago. Director Wilkerson. <gasps> so here is the audio lock, and now the Victrola we found in the museum director's house makes a bit more sense. So we need to repeat this um, well combination. We need to repeat this melody on this. That sounds like the last note. And this is the first one. 
That's not the right note at all. And neither is this. Okay. I love this puzzle. It might be my favorite in this mission. To do. Find another room for Curator Jennings. Her current office is frequented by too many people, as it represents the only sensible way from the stairs to the rooms on the third floor. Memorize wife's name. Ask flower lady if necessary. That's an interesting thing to do. Determine if cracked glass panes were due to careless transport or faulty material. Find replacement as soon as possible. We can't have reckless museum visitors climbing into the diorama. A write letter of thanks to Lady Valerius for her generous donation of several musical instruments. Located Martin character. Of the three books he had borrowed from the museum library, two came back yesterday, with pages dog-eared and even ripped out. Martin's claim to be a scholar from the city was likely a deception, if Martin even is his real name. Inventor's letter. Dear Mr. Wilkerson, as much as I sympathize with your complaint, I must decline a request to relocate the code puncher. In order to transport it down the elevator, I would have to disassemble the apparatus, which is something I cannot take responsibility for, as the puncher contains a considerable amount of very fragile machinery. Consequently, to acquire a new punch card for the maintenance units, the procedure remains the same. Send somebody to my tower to convey the service point number, and I shall provide the messenger with the card right away. Yours sincerely, George Balston. So to get the punch card, we're gonna have to visit the museum... not the museum, the... inventor's tower, and we already know where it is. And here we have books with letters on them. Maybe this has something to do with the museum director's inability to remember his wife's name, which, as we remember from the flower card, is Elaine. At least for me. Note that this name is randomly generated each time I play the mission, so it can be different. But let's try to input that in here. There we go. First here, and a note. Mr. Wilkerson, remember to always deactivate the Blu-rays with the switch in this room before you deactivate the main energy field. Accordingly, if you reactivate the energy field, the blue rays need to be activated afterwards. In case you trigger the alarm by accident, you can turn it off by pushing the button opposite the switch. The blue rays deactivate themselves if they trigger the alarm. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, George Bolston. So that switch is right here. Blue security race control, and since we have to deactivate it before messing with the energy field, may as well do that right now. Here is also a book that was presumably borrowed from the library and came back with pages ripped out. Summoning and binding. Enchanting items in order to enhance them with magical abilities is a common practice, which, however, does not always deliver the desired results. Skilled mages prefer the summoning and binding of a demon as a significantly more powerful alternative. This method involves calling an otherworldly fiend and immediately imprisoning it inside an object which in turn gates some of the trapped demon's powers. Similar to a lion tamer, a summoner must be in control of the demon he is calling. The slightest inattentiveness can prove fatal, because once a demon is unleashed, it can wreck the spellcaster's household or turn an entire city to ashes, depending on the size of the summoned fiend. Naturally, spells that imprison demons must outlast their caster without fail. Here we have something about Broken Triad and the sign of the Dawn Mages, which we remember from Amina's bequest. And over there is a switch that we can reach with the staff. Now, where is that guard? Don't want to alert him while doing this. So, to aim the staff, you can use the reticle of your bow. The top of it is where the shot will go. And here we have the Emerald Room that the museum director said doesn't exist, but evidently it does. Hello? 
Hello? Someone there. And here we have a large gemstone, which is one of our secrets. Brings the total loot to 11.15. Thought... I saw something. I like how the guard doesn't even acknowledge oh, well, the emerald room. What it was. Henry, once and for all, it does not matter if Brother Reginald is harmless or not. How do you think Inspector Swan is going to react if he hears about a ghost waltzing through the museum at night? Instead of recommendation, we'd get a closing order. I thought they'd taken care of Brother Reginald 20 years ago, but his recent reappearance proves otherwise. Now get me a hemorrhoid priest and tell him one of his dead brethren still thinks he's, he has to keep watch over Lord Raglan's crypt in the cemetery. We've spent a lot of time and money to raise the security system into a class of its own. Need I remind you that without the burglar proof award, the management won't be able to sell the Harrogate, direct to Wilkerson. And here is Sheila's office. Let's make a save. Let's read this. Sheila, since you didn't show up for work today, I'm just leaving you this quick note. Because of last Friday's incident, we moved the horn, as you suggested. It's now hanging about the sleeper, where it can be reached by any more jokesters who might be tempted to play it. They didn't get a single tone out of it anyway, that thing must be clogged with dust. Director Wilkerson bumped into me today, when he stormed out of his office. He didn't bother apologizing, instead he asked me, in a perfectly serious tone, what the name of his wife was, as if I was keeping track of his private life. Before you know it, he'll ask us to remember his wife's birthday and their wedding day too. Oh, and did you know he wants to get rid of Brother Reginald? I'll see you when you come back, Deidre. So as you remember from the burned note, I need to turn off the lights here and activate the oil lamp. For that we need to fill it first. There we can see Ned getting up. And leaving. And let's talk a little bit about this whole setup here. Because this is pretty much a thing you would see in a key hunt mission. In fact, it would have been very easy for the author to just say that Ned had already given Sheila a key to the watch station and that Sheila keeps it in her office. The mission would flow the exact same way in this case. It would just be a bit lame. And typically I'm not a fan of setups like this, but in this case I really like this part for two reasons. First of all, the context. Because it's not a simple go to the museum, get a key, then go to watch station, and because it's reframed in a more interesting way with signaling a guy in a watch station, it feels fresh and kind of cool. The second reason might actually have to do with nostalgia, because like I said, this was one of the very first missions I've played, and at the time I wasn't yet fed up with key hunts, and actually I thought it was genius the way this was structured. In order to do the museum job, you have to break into the museum, but not actually do the museum job, and do it later. I've never seen anything like this before, and like I said, it was mind-blowing. So while this can be seen as a way to bloat the mission, to add unnecessary length to it, I still like this part a lot, but would I like to see these kinds of setups in every mission I play? No. Here is a green handle door leading to the receptor on the roof that we're gonna handle once we come back.
right. In these footlockers, there is nothing of value. Hey, Jorah, why don't you go outside and take a break? Nah, I just had one ten minutes ago. Well, take another. I can't leave the equipment unguarded. You know the rules. I can stand in for you. Ha! Huh. I don't want to lose my job. Last time you had this post, the sergeant caught you sleeping on the floor. Come on, that wasn't my fault. One of those gas mines blew up in my face. Whatever, Ned. I'm not leaving this post. But Miss Jennings said... I mean, uh... Uh... Never mind. So when the light is off again, sneak behind the guy and into the vent. Now we need this guy to turn around. You are safe in these patches Nothing. of shadow. I'm too tense. Is someone there? Well, and we are looking there. for a secret passage in the last cell. And the switch to open the passage is outside of the cell behind the arch. So that was pretty accurate. Now down here we have some kind of a crypt, which I thought was supposed to be a war tunnel. And here we have three spiders with random patrol routes. And this is actually pretty tricky. I didn't even know he could spot me all the way up here. Right, that was risky, but it paid off. The thing with this place is that you're not safe in any of these corners. Even though it looks dark, if the spiders bump into you, they'll actually catch you. Here is a grate. And to open it, I have to sneak by this extinct type of spider and flip a lever there. I'm using a mass arrow here, you don't have to do this, but it makes get into the lever a little easier. Now, this bit, okay, nobody heard that, is a little obscure because if you go through here and don't look up, you might be wondering what that lever actually does. So this could have been maybe communicated a little bit better. And here we finally get the green skeleton key, with which we'll be able to access a lot of places. Here, there is nothing. <laughs> On the second floor, there is no loot, just a healing fruit. <clears throat> and hmm. this takes us to Seeing a familiar things. place. Third time this shift. I got a hand and with the green key, we can break in here. In the jewelers, there is a whole bunch of loot. Here is a switch, and a very well hidden secret switch. There we go, level 1555. Let's read this letter. 
Dear sister, to date I had no luck finding any trace of the blood to your ruby. It must have been in Alarius's possession at one time, but he probably sold it before his sudden disappearance. Alas, his journal doesn't mention anything about a potential buyer. However, there is an interesting passage about Alarius trying to track down a gemstone called Solar Core. According to him, the stone used to be in possession of the late Lord Valerius, whose granddaughter runs an opera house in the city. When the man died, he left behind a large collection of musical instruments, but there was no trace of the solar core. Elarius planned to visit Lady Valerius to gather information on the possible whereabouts of the stone, but he vanished before he could do so. Maybe we should contact her sometimes. Yours, Ben. And down here... Have a safe. Total 1580 and the letter. Honored Elarius, I have always valued your expertise as a jeweler, and I am currently in the position of making an offer that undoubtedly will be most appealing to you. As I would like to discuss matters in person, I hereby invite you to visit our summer estate for dinner. Just send the reply name and the day that is to your convenience, and I shall provide you with a carriage. Sincerely, Lord Edward Farrington. Well, Elarius didn't come back from this journey. Now, even though we have the green skeleton key, we're not gonna go back to the museum right away. There is one more place we need to hit, remember? The inventor's tower. We need to get a punch card. So if you don't have the skeleton key, this is as far as you go. Personal notes. Tested Martin suggested settings on prototype today. Efficiency of solar reception went slightly down, while lunar reception improved at astonishing rate. Keeping spectral receptor active also during nighttime seems reasonable. Going to recommend adjustments to Director Wilkerson. Must locate Martin and ask how he calculated those figures. He claimed to have come all the way from the city just to visit me. And he knew I had best a receptor on precursor technology. Evidently, my reputation precedes me. There is some blood dripping from the ceiling. That doesn't look good. And because the elevator is busted, I need to do a bit of climbing here. Here. How do you like my work, Garrett? Well, I gotta say, I'm not a big fan, so let's just clean this up and get a bonus objective. Good thinking. You don't want your name getting connected with these murders. Mr. Bolston, here are the figures I mentioned during our chat. Might I also suggest adopting these settings to the museum system if you find the results satisfactory? It has been a pleasure and inspiration talking to you. Sincerely, Martin. And a code puncher. So the only security port in the museum we saw was the port 0928. So that's the only punch card again I need. Here we can actually just walk forward and land on this.
now it's time to do the museum job. Who's over there? Uh, gotta stay on my toes anyway. on this thing somewhere. Right, I reloaded after I triggered this command. Here we go. So now we can activate this maintenance bot and we'll be able to get past the laser security that? in the other half of the basement. Which actually has nothing to do with getting the sleeper. But we wanna get into that area regardless. <laughs> This is what the security field looks like, by the way, before you deactivate it. And here is the basement receptor, which of course you shouldn't mess with until you've disabled the blue rays, but we've done that already on our first visit. Once you've used the punch card, you can press this button and this fellow will come through and deactivate the lasers for us. Precursor City. The scaled model of a precursor city shows how this ancient civilization may have looked like during its prime. Precursor tablet. This sandstone tablet was found in a cave a few miles southwest of Arkford. Scholars have been unable to translate the inscription in its entirety. Assumedly, it describes a rite of passage common in precursor culture. Luckily, Garrett can read it. To complete their initiation, aspirants to the Dark Watch must drink of the blood of Yenapa. They shall stay in the chamber of passage for three days until their skin has become as dark and hard as ebony. Only those of worth can withstand the pain of passage, all others will perish within the very first day. Existing between the dead and the living, members of the Dark Watch have the honor to guard over the city of the dead and ensure safe travel to the stars for the deceased. So I remember seeing some comments along the lines of why are all the scrolls in a lost city are written in plain English? And the answer is they aren't. They are probably written in hieroglyphs like this and Garrett can read them because he knows the language because he has keeper training. Alabaster Mortar. The precursors were advanced medical practitioners for the time. Mortar and pestle were used by healers to grind and mix spices and herbs. Burial Rite. The serpent staff was presumably used during burial ceremonies of precursor societies, important public figures. Ritual Dagger. This dagger's curved blade is still as sharp as it was centuries ago. It was mainly used in rituals to offer the blood of small animals to the gods. Precursor Brazier. Igniting this brazier results in a magical fire that was allegedly used for cleansing rituals. The blue flames do not burn, but it was found that they can clean stained silverware in an instant. And we can get in here, and this is the main reason to come to this area. The ritual dagger. We're gonna need it later. And you can of course skip it for now, but then you're gonna have to come back to the museum for the third time. There is also a secret area back here with a jar for a total of 
think I saw something. Mm, nothing, I guess. Oh, well. Look, all of that. There. Oh. Here is the roof receptor, and now the energy field should be down. Shortcut for sure. Now that we have the key, Stravioli violin. The unique sound of Stravioli's masterfully crafted violins has been enchanting music enthusiasts for decades. Alas, due to their rarity, the violins have become hey, mere someone back there. Mirror museum exhibits and aren't allowed to be played. This is one map. of them. Won't be so spooked then. Not such a bad job. Stand down. The battle at Widow's Tear. After successfully infiltrating the castle at Widow's Tear, Lord Verez puts the leader of the resistance to the sword. Lord Verez's original uniform is part of the White Collection and exhibited here with the permission of Lady Melinda White. Right, that woman is gonna go into some that? sort of maintenance room right now. And while she's in there, much after all. we have an opportunity. Something there? To do this. Here is that horn that we read is clogged with something. And using the bellows on it reveals the solar core was inside it. <laughs> Bonus, the solar core will surely find, find a generous buyer. <laughs> so it brings the total to 1880, and that's what you need the bellows for. The spitter, a musical instrument from the last century that is played by salivating into it. Please do not try operating the exhibit. Bag of pipes, played mainly in the northern regions of the barony, this instrument needs a lot of practice to not make it sound like a wheezing horse. Right, the last one I'll read something. in a little. If I stay here, that woman is gonna catch me. Guess it wasn't much after all. So, meanwhile, let's grab a coin here and get into this. Attic space. <laughs> Where we have an artifact. Total 1905. Transient Audio Cascade Oscillator. Although its purpose is not for certain, this object is said to be an intricate musical instrument with extraordinary collector's value. <coughs> the Horn of Quintus. Once buried with the Quintus family in the Bone Horde, this legendary horn went through many hands until it finally found its place in Harrogate's collection. How many times am I going to steal this thing? So you can take the horn with you. It's not needed for anything, but you can use it for something. Hmm. Roddick's skull. The controversial philosopher Reynold Roddick 
used this skull during a speech to support his point that death must be a pleasant experience, evidenced by the skull's grinning expression. Hey, someone back there? The inverted hourglass. Created by Nibros, a legendary mage, this magical hourglass contains sand that travels upwards. Nimorous repeatedly hmm, reputedly intended to use it to reverse time, but instead, upon turning the hourglass, he aged several hundred years and died in a blink of an eye. I never the bones of Zog. Traditional urn. A cemetery space has become scarce, cremations are raising in popularity. The urns containing the deceased's ashes make an excellent mantelpiece decoration. Urn displayed with generous permission of Delahaye Crematorium. Blessed Hammer. Blessed hammers, such as this one, are commonly used by hemorrhoids during burial ceremonies. So this is the second item you want to take. If you don't want to come back to the museum for the third time. We don't need it right now, but we will. So let's do the swap. The Sleeper. Rumor has it all. that an unknown artist sculpted this forbidden stone bust during a fever dream. Allegedly, he died from shock when he saw his finished creation with clear eyes. So we've done our main goal now, but we still need to reactivate the security. the guard coming this way, so let's wait. It's more prudent to start with this receptor, because we still need to reactivate the blue rays. go. So the optional objective to avoid triggering any alarm systems will trigger at the end of the mission. So now we just need to get back to our apartment and we are done with the first part of the mission. So here I want to show you can use the skeleton key to get out above the museum's front door, but it's actually faster to just use the basement. Hello. Show yourself. What's that? There is another green handle door which leads to the inn. <gasps> <laughs> so 
So let's save it here. Ah, Garrett, we finally meet. I am Keeper Leonard. Forgive the intrusion, but I have an important message for you. What do you want from me? Only a few days ago, we Keepers learned about your defeat of the necromancer, Kadar. I was sent by the Keeper Council to warn you about the shadow that's been following you since that day. There's a demon living inside of you, Garrett, and he is trying to take over your body. Until now, he has only managed to take control of you at night. He has been using you to live out his hideous fantasies. You don't have any recollection of this. The demon has been suppressing your memory. You've got to be kidding me. Now, I am well aware all of this is hard to believe, but there is proof, Garrett. There is a secret passage in your bedroom. It is not well hidden, but the demon has made you oblivious to its existence. Seek this passage and examine the contents of the rooms below. Afterwards, return to me. Right, I got a plot twist, just like an Amano's bequest. As soon as you think you're done with the mission, you're not. You are not yourself. Look in here. Kill them all. The sword. Narsal. Get out of my head. What have I done? And we have the heads of Sheila, the inventor, and a blacksmith. And we got some reading to do. Although you don't remember writing any of this, you can help but recognize your own handwriting. I do not know how much longer I can endure this inner struggle. Each night is the same. With sleep there comes the shadow. A demon that calls himself Narsal takes control over my body to steal his murderous lust and each night I regain consciousness in the cellar, sometimes with dark blood on my hands, and sometimes with a fresh head stuck on a spike. During this short period of clarity, I know what's happening to me. I've tried leaving messages to warn myself, but no matter what I do, hours later I wake up in my bed, unaware of what has happened. I've smeared warnings on the bedroom walls, but Nurcell's influence makes me oblivious to them. I try to leave this book next to the bed, but I never find any text in it, because the written pages were ripped out and burned. The demon is mocking my feeble attempts at alerting myself. I think he even made me leave a message with my name on it in the inventor's tower, simply for his amusement. Although Narsal sleeps during daytime and lets me be my normal self, his grip remains firmly around me. I bullied the curator into helping me gain access to the museum, and yesterday I killed her. I am not sure how and when this started, but the sword must be an important part of it. I pulled the Dharmacast out of an altar in the depths below Catacombs, below Farrington Manor, and I used it to destroy the Book of Souls. Did this set the demon free? I try to destroy the sword, but only when Nersal awakens in me can I penetrate its shield of fire and take it away from the cellar. The demon wields the Dharmacast to decapitate his victims, and with each murder the sword's glow shifts more and more to a deep red. How can I stop this fiend from gaining power over me? Each passing night makes me weaker, and I fear that it won't be long until the demon is strong enough to remain awake during daytime as well. I am fighting a in battle. If only the keepers would find me. I have a feeling they'd know what to do. Personal Notes of Acrob, Seventh Mage of the Dawn I am now certain that the circumstances which made me Zodormikost's owner were not at all fortuitous. Three months ago, I was on a mission to gather information about Lauren's Horn when I stayed overnight at an inn not far from the city. In the middle of the night, I was yanked out of my sleep when somebody violently knocked against the door of my room. Before I could even get out of bed, the door was forced open, and a heavily breathing giant of a man was towering over me. He was armed with a peculiar sword, and even in the half-darkness, I could see the frantic madness in his eyes. Where is the book? he asked, with a hoarse voice. I was unable to speak, and I could only watch in horror as he raised the sword over his head. Where is the book? he asked again, 
making it clear his blade would answer if I did not. Realizing I could not manage to utter a single word, I closed my eyes awaiting the sword's blow. But it did not come. Instead, I heard a gurgling sound followed by something heavy dropping to the floor. When I dared to open my eyes again, I saw the man lying at the foot of my bed, his head resting several inches away from his motionless body. On the bed, directly in front of me, laid the sword, as if it were presented to me on a plate. Not a single drop of blood stained its blade. Without thinking, I grabbed the weapon, and the moment I touched its hilt, a strong feeling of purpose overcame me. I immediately knew the sword had a name, and there was a tail behind it. I collected my belongings and left the inn in a hurry. To this day, I do not know where this towering man had come from. Back then, I thought I had survived the brute's attack by mere luck, but now I am sure it was the sword's decision. The Dormacast betrayed its owner, because it wanted me to obtain it. As unusual as it might be for a mage to wield such a weapon, I feel that the sword belongs to me as much as I belong to the sword. Various books I have read indicate that the Dormacast must have gone through many hands in the past, restlessly searching for its counterpart, the Book of Souls. I believe it is the sword's destiny, and thus mine, to destroy the book. Now that the necromancer Kadar has stolen this very tome, I shall use the sword to put an end to his depraved experiments tonight. Acrob, seventh mage of the dawn. And we also have a secret hero. With another readable. These loose pages are the second part of transcribed correspondence between two merchants. With the help of the island's natives, we hauled a couple of crates from the ship and transported them into their city. We set up our boxes at what appeared to be the marketplace. It didn't take long for curious folks to gather around us and inspect the goods we had brought with us. They were unusually enthralled by the most mundane trinkets and readily traded their jewelry for it. No doubt, this was a merchant's dream, and for a while we stopped worrying about not knowing where we were. The sounds of engaged barter abruptly subsided when someone from the back barked a few harsh sounding words. The crowd reverently made way for an elderly man who promptly stepped forward. From the garments he was wearing, I assumed he was some sort of nobleman or priest. He eyeballed us with a remarkably sour and disapproving look, and then proceeded to examine the content of the crates. It occurred to me that trading with strangers could be against some law of theirs, and I already expected the old man to forbid any further dealings with us. However, when he opened the lid of the last box, his eyes widened in apparent surprise. Whatever he had spotted in there, it made him slam the lid shut and leave with a puzzled expression. As soon as he was out of earshot, the crowd resumed looking through our wares as if nothing had happened. The sound had already disappeared behind the buildings when we received an invitation to speak with somebody who could help pinpoint our current location. An enticing woman clad in gleaming golden tissues led us into a towering building that equally reminded me of a palace and a crypt. Inside, we were seated at a long table that was so low we had to sit on floor cushions. Two servants provided us with cups of sweet taste and wine while we were waiting for the host to arrive. And this is where my memory becomes murky. The next thing I remember, I found myself and the crew on the white squid, along with rowing boats back in place. The sails were all set, and the ship's wheel was held in place by ropes. The sea surrounded us, and there, were, there was no trace of any island in sight. Neither the man who had been on the island with me, nor those who had stayed on the ship, possessed any recollection of what has happened. I started to doubt we had really found an inhabited island, but a look into the hold was enough to dismiss my notion of mass hallucination. The crates were filled with every last piece of jewelry we had obtained on the island. The only thing I found missing was a decorative warhammer, which unsurprisingly had been in the very crate that the old man had found a curious interest in. To our luck, the stars made sense again, and we soon discovered that we were on the perfect course back to the city's harbor. I can only guess why the island's natives bid us farewell like this. Despite their friendliness, they were wary of strangers and likely didn't want us to return or bring other people with us. And then, while sailing home, something astonishing dawned on me. The decorations and trinkets I had seen on the island had felt familiar to me for a reason. They were precursor. I do not understand how precursor culture reached this secluded island and managed to survive much longer than the people of Carathin. They must have left their capital city ages ago before the cataclysm buried it under a ton of stone, during a time when shipbuilding was still in its infancy. How they constructed a vessel that could sail this far is a mystery to me. 
If you had been there and seen it with your own eyes, you'd understand why I have to find this island again, even after all these years. If you want to come with me, you have time to decide until next Sunday. Then I'll set the sails of the White Squid and search for this island, Captain Denko. And there is some sort of a picture here. Do you understand now? A demon that goes by the name of Narsal took hold of you and made you kill all those innocent people. You, you, Garrett, are what the newspaper calls the Mad Beheader. From the little research I could gather beforehand, I learned about the demon's origins. It all started many decades ago with an overconfident mage apprentice. Despite his master's warnings not to meddle with beings from other worlds, the apprentice intended to summon a demon and bind him into two items, a sword and a book. However, the young mage had far underestimated the demon's power. His spell was too weak to bind Narsal properly. His essence was imprisoned into the two items, but instead of being a passive enchantment, the demon had partial influence over whoever owned the book or the sword. As a result of his foolishness, the apprentice lost his sanity. He gave the two items away, ending his life shortly thereafter. You see, when you destroyed the Book of Souls with the sword, you allowed the demon that had been trapped within the pages to enter you. Unfortunately, we cannot destroy the sword. Part of the demon still remains inside the weapon and protects it. However, if we manage to drive Narsal out of your body and prevent him from finding another host, the blade will shatter. We have little time left. You must act quickly. What can I do? I have placed several items on the table here along with a note that explains what you need to do. I cannot stay here to help you. I must do further research. Just read the note carefully and follow the instructions. Farewell, Garrett, and good luck. New objectives. Follow Keeper Leonard's instructions to get rid of Narsal. So let's read this. Keeper Leonard's note. In order to banish Narsal back into his own realm, you need to accomplish two things. First, you need to die, as a demon can only reside inside a living host. Second, when Narsal has left your body, you must ensure that he cannot find another host in time. As paradoxical as it may sound, your death can be arranged without you having to die. All you need to do is prepare a so-called Nightshade Potion and drink it. This concoction temporarily puts its drinker into a very deep sleep that can't be distinguished from death. This should fool the demon long enough to be driven out of your body. Without a host, a demon cannot exist outside his own dimension for long and must find another physical body to enter immediately. Thus you have to drink the potion in a secluded place. We also have to take into account that Nurse might discover that you are not really dead and attempt to re-enter you. To prevent this, you must stand in a protective circle that can shield you from Nurse once he's been expelled. I have provided you with the recipe for the Nightshade potion. It lists all required ingredients and describes how to prepare them. I've also added some notes that should help you find everything needed. I couldn't make the potion for you in advance, 
as it only works on the one who brews it. When you've created the potion, head for White Cathedral. Fortunately, it is currently empty and secluded enough to prevent Nursal from finding another host. I've installed the protective circle inside the cathedral. In order to activate it, you need to find fresh roots from a dark wood tree and make sawdust out of them. Sprinkle the sawdust into the fire behind the circle. Once the flames have changed their color, the circle should become active when you stand in its center. Drink the nightshade potion there and get rid of Nursal once and for all. Good luck, Keeper Leonard. Recipe Recipe for Nightshade Potion Ingredients A blend of the following herbs, which I'm not gonna read The names of Take the leaf package I've placed on the table. It contains all the herbs listed here. Blood of the person drinking the potion. That is your blood, of course. Preparation The ingredients must be dropped into an active death watch fountain. There is one in the catacombs underneath Arkford streets. You just need to activate it. The blood of the drinker needs to be spilled by cutting his hand with a sacrificial dagger. You'll likely find an appropriate item in the museum. Fill a hollowed chalice with the liquid when it's simmering. The hammers left a chalice in their quarters near White Cathedral. Just drop the cup into the Death Watch fountain and pick it up again. The effect of seeming death lasts for up to two hours. Narsal won't be able to remain outside a physical body for more than a few seconds. This is my favorite ribble in this mission. I love how it's written with the notes. So let's take the leaf package and white cathedral key. And I should drop the bellows, I don't need them anymore. And let's save the game. Right, so now we need to collect a bunch of stuff, and I'm gonna start with making sawdust out of this tree root we got earlier. Which we could have done before, as a matter of fact, but I decided not to, because I think it's a bit immersion breaking to use the wood chipper before Garrett realistically would know that he has to use it. Hello? It's never really anything. Although I did pick up the tree root itself, so... Maybe I'm contradicting myself here. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. What's that? Oh well. Oh, strange noises. I saw something. Anyway, remember this warehouse? This is where we get the sawdust. For your own safety, this wood chipper requires the lid to be closed and locked before the start button becomes operational. Only drop unworked wood into the machine. Anything else will be rejected by the inside sensors. So we need to get a key for this. And there are two ways of getting it. The first one, and the funnier one of the two, is to do this. And even though it's not counted as a knockout in the stats, I still consider it to be one. So that would be a bust to ghost. And I'm gonna have to do this the other way. Which is to use this vent. We can grab the key like this. So, like I said, you can do this as soon as you have the tree root. You don't have to wait until you actually get the instructions from Keeper Leonard. And now the first item on our shopping list is checked off. Now I need to head for the White Cathedral. Oh, 
Hello? Show yourself. So now's a good time to talk about the backtracking in this mission. And believe it or not, I actually have no problem with having to traverse the same areas we've already explored for a couple of reasons. And those reasons aren't Third time this shift. Well, maybe I gotta calm down. I am a bit influenced by my nostalgia for this mission. Information. White Cathedral remains closed until further notice. Please repent elsewhere. So, we need the White Cathedral key. And we may as well drop the sawdust into the flame here. So now it's changed its color. Once we have the Nightshade Potion, we can drink it here. This room there is nothing of interest. That door is locked and unpickable. This one is. If thou touchest the cup, the watchers will harm thee, but they cannot punish whom they do not see. So this is barely a puzzle. We have to make sure that all the statues are facing the other way, but you just have to flip the switches in order. And once you do the third one, you're done. There we go. So yeah, the backtracking. The first reason I don't mind it in this mission is because I think it has nearly perfect pacing. In other words, there is enough interesting stuff to do in between all the backtracking that it doesn't really become tedious. It doesn't have that problem that Ominous Bequest does, where it becomes kind of a slog in its last act. But here the story and the gameplay kind of keeps me engaged for the entire duration of this mission. And the second reason has to do with the mission's size. Now, I made it a point early on in the video that this map, the city and the museum what? itself, aren't very big. It takes less than a minute to get from one end of the city to the other, and it takes less than a minute to traverse the museum, so the backtracking doesn't feel like it's taken too long. And this, I think, is something that not every fan mission author understands, especially when they try to create a mission like this, an epic adventure mission. Because what also ends up happening is that they create huge, huge maps, and when you have to traverse those for like three or four times back and forth, that does become tedious. Right, now we can head into this building, which I skipped until now. Today I sold the last remaining horn to Lord Wrighton for 253 gold. He rarely leaves his manor nowadays, so he should be fairly safe. 
I need to increase the radius again to make sure none of my clients will meet before I complete my little trade. I have to go downstairs to replenish my stock. This time, without falling off the chair, while trying to reach that stupid opening mechanism. Mm, this chair? Here we have a secret, and the reason I skipped this place until now is I didn't have the Horn of Quintus. Now that I do, I can actually do something in here. So there we can see a bunch of horns. Spell of Duplication. Place the archetype on the altar and perform incantations 6 and 7 as described in the section C of the appendix. The spell will build up as long as the archetype stays on the altar. Remove the archetype after the appropriate time and stand aside to let the duplicates take shape. Before invoking the spell, ensure that the surroundings are cleared and allow enough space for duplicates to appear. Do not allow the archetype to remain on the altar for too long. To reverse the spell, place the first created duplicate on the altar. Only the archetype will remain. So we can place the horn here. Then all these will disappear. And we get the real, presumably, Horn of Quintus. Bonus! At least now you know why you came across this horn so many times in the past. Nice. I guess in the early days of fan missions, the Horn of Quintus <laughs> was a really popular item for the authors to include and make an objective. So the author of this mission decided to come up with an explanation for that. Just kind of funny. <sighs> so yeah, having to traverse Arkford a couple times, I really don't mind. My only problem with it is the current section we are dealing with right now, because you have to go to the White Cathedral to get a cup, then you have to go all the way back here, and then to the White Cathedral again. Now this could have been a bit more streamlined, like the cup maybe could have been found in this section of town. That's my only problem. So this, as it turns out, is a Death Watch Fountain, and we can activate it with the Blessed Hammer we found in the museum. Now we need to drop the leaf package, and we need to cut ourselves with the dagger, also found in the museum. And now we drop the cup in here, pick it up again, and we have the Nightshade Potion.
Right. Bottoms up. You are back. You have the replica? Yes, my friend. Very good. Repulsive and ugly. Just like the original. I take it the sculptor wasn't too curious about the strange material you gave him to work with. Kill him all the same. We cannot take any risks now that we are so close. The inventor went to the museum today to make the adjustments I had suggested to him. You can get rid of him in your usual fashion as well. I read the pages that you wrote to yourself. If only the keepers would find me. Nice way to put it. Your host might not be the type to keep a diary, but seeing his own handwriting will be enough to make Garrett trust my words like a mindless dog. Leave the pages on this table so you'll easily find them when I direct you to the cellar. Remember, you must not take possession of Garrett that night. Only if you let him be himself will he have the required thieving skills to do the museum job. Once he has placed the Moonstone into the energy field, I'll wait for him in his apartment. He will prepare the potion according to my directions and drink it in the White Cathedral. The Focus Circle will hold you within Garrett's body long enough for me to arrive. And then you'll finally be able to join your other half within me. Double plot twist. Just like in Amino's Bequest. How was your near-death experience, Garrett? Did you see the false light? Of course you did. You flew right into it. You have my gratitude. You have opened the inner chamber for me, and now your last task is at hand. The demon inside you is eager to leave your body. Narso wants to join his other half, the one that is residing in me. I am his chosen host, and I shall be the one to restore him to his full glory. Come to me. Come to me. <laughs> yes, the triad is almost completely broken. The last remaining item is waiting for me behind the moon portal that you've prepared. You have served me well, Garrett. You shall have the honor of being the first man to be sacrificed to the fire in my name. Now I will say, I think the double plot twist is realized much better in Broken Triad than in Amara's Bequest, because if you remember in that mission, the second plot twist comes minutes after the first one. And here we actually had to do some stuff, so like I said, this mission is much better paced. So 
So let's make our last real save right here. Garrett, I managed to deactivate the furnace so you can make it out alive. Unfortunately, I cannot wait for you to regain consciousness. My name is Keeper Aleph, and I've been following Keeper Leonard for several months now, trying to uncover what he is after. I was hoping to arrive here before he'd opened the portal, but it took me a long time to track you to down and piece together Leonard's plan. I can't go into details right now, all I ask of you is to follow me into the museum. A portal has opened in the central hall, a portal you unwittingly helped to construct tonight. Leonard, or however he calls himself now, already stepped through it, and if nobody stops him, we're going to face a new dark age very soon. There is a reason why so many deceased linger restlessly in our world, and Leonard has become part of the cause. I need your help, as I probably won't stand a chance against Leonard on my own. I ask the Keeper Council for assistance, but to their eyes I'm just an over-eager librarian, and they'd rather interpret the process for the umpteenth time than actively do anything. I know you don't like being told what to do, especially from a Keeper, but consider the negative effects on a business if Leonard did to the whole world what he's done to Arkford's people tonight. Just step outside, and you'll see what I mean. Keeper Aleph. P.S. Be careful. You are in the crematorium, and I felt a certain unrest that's befallen the place. Leonard wanted to burn you alive to make a slave out of you. To keep you safe, I'm going to lock this door behind me. I don't like the looks of this. Right, these two objectives are now cancelled, and we have a new one. Enter the portal in the museum, and hope Keeper Aleph isn't playing games with you either. So this door I'm gonna have to pick. Now, when we step into this room, an ash creature will start emerging from that urn, but if you pick the door on the other side fast enough, you're not gonna have to deal with that. We will, however, have to deal with other ash creatures. Here we have Hammer Quarters Key and Keeper Leonard's Checklist. Convince the Hammerites to lend us the White Cathedral. Tuck the inventor into changing the Spectral Receptor settings. Move the three portal foci into the secret room inside Garrett's basement. They won't be needed until the thief has placed the Moonstone in the museum and reactivated the energy field around it. The stone will take some time to absorb sufficient lunar energy. Make sure the unpossessed Garrett doesn't discover that the real slipper has hardly any collector's value. Now that's a real punch in the gut. Wait until Garrett has successfully opened the inner chamber and returned from his near-death experience. Find Dre Warwick on the other side and break the triad. Now I actually like this readable, because on the one hand it does seem like a cliché, the bad guy is dropping his notes while escaping, but its format makes a lot of sense, because it's not his notes, like, haha, my evil plan is now finally coming into fruition. It's an actual checklist, which makes in-world sense, and he also didn't just drop it on his way, he threw it away, because he didn't need it anymore. In that urn, we have a ring, total 1935. These guys are creepy. That guy never moves, and to get past him, we're gonna have to round this corner very quickly. So that is most likely a first alert, but nothing we have to worry about.
I do like the lighting in this room. We're in the crematorium's lobby. An interesting fact here, by the way, this is not a reflective surface. I actually went into Dromed to see how this room was done, and there actually is a replica, an upside-down replica of this room down below, and this is a semi-transparent surface. That's pretty clever. Well then, we could go straight to the museum, but now that we have the hammerite quarters key, we can unlock that door I told you was unpickable. So you don't have to do it, it's completely optional, but there is a piece of loot there to get. go, hammer, total 1960, and we have a note here. We were gathered for dinner when a sharp scream came from the kitchen. Brother Clayton, always having his hammer within reach, was the first to get up. He was also the first to be toppled over by a man who moved so swiftly his motions were a single blur. Before I could react, Brother Clayton's hammer connected with my skull. When I regained consciousness, I found my brother unslain. Blood was trickling into my eyes, and every heartbeat made my head ring with pain. I soon found out that my keyring had been stolen and used to lock the doors. I must have been trapped inside this room for several days now. I tried to smash the windows, but my blows were too weak to break them. I tried screaming for help, but no one could hear me. I do not know what is going on inside. Each passing hour makes it more likely I won't leave this room alive. Just like an ominous bequest, the very last readable we find in the mission is also the worst one, because... come on. If you were hit on the head with a hammer, and blood was trickling down into your eyes, you wouldn't be writing all this down, it's ridiculous. But I will reiterate, I do like the writing in the mission overall. I heard some criticism of the writing in Broken Triad, and so far all the readables, except this one, have been pretty okay. Some were actually good, I think. So maybe that was in reference to the second mission, but from memory, the readables in that one are pretty much on par with the readables in this mission. It's kind of funny that there is a crowd inside here, given what's going on in the city. And actually what's even funnier is if you go back into the casino, You'll see that these guys are still gambling, and I think that's hilarious. It's also a nice way to mess with the player, because on my second playthrough of the mission, I thought, well, I don't want to deal with Ghost in the Casino, I'll just wait until everyone in the city is dead, and I'll hit it then, and nope, it's just as challenging as at the beginning of the mission. However, now we can lockpick this safe, which is not as challenging as before, because there is nobody who can catch us here. We have to 
Bronze Tax total, 2010. And bonus, you found all the loot in the mission. And I don't think you can wait with using the bellows on the horn, because as you can see, the horn is no longer here. Right, mission complete. In 1 hour 47 minutes 53 seconds, found all the loot 2010, picked 4 pockets, 26 locks, and found all 8 secrets. Now there is bodies discovered by enemies 1. This is completely random, but I can tell you how to avoid it. This happens when people in the city die. And the exact moment this happens is when you open the crematorium's door. So if you want to avoid any bodies discovered in your stats, you can save before opening the door and just keep reloading until you get nothing in your stats. So sometimes you get nothing, sometimes you get two bodies found, sometimes you get three bodies found, but this is not from something I have done, so I don't really care about this. Right, so let's make a save right here and I'll see you guys for the second mission, Tempest Isle. For now, have a good day and take care.